work ahead. And so I'm delighted uh, that on this final class uh, meeting, um, Professor May, who himself comes from a, a peace tradition, um, is going to um, give us a kind of genealogy of, of nonviolence um, in the you know, American um, story. Uh, you may not know that um, Isaac finished his dissertation only last spring. Um, it was um, and is a, a terrific book. I love the title. Um, you're going to have to help me out here. Um, God Optional Religion and... In 20th century America, it's Quakers, Unitarians, Reconstructionist Jews, and the, the crisis of theism. I just love that term, God optional. And that's, um, that's, that's Isaac's um, app original appellation. And um, he has now, after several months of uh, hard work, revised that dissertation um, to be submitted to uh, publishers and... Um, Hopefully by the end of this week, he'll have a letter off to some major university presses. And as I said a few weeks ago, next time around, we will, we will teach, um, we will teach his, his, his best-selling um, dissertation turned publication, maybe, you know, with the film uh, rights sold to Brad Pitt, you know, and um, I don't know, um, um, Morgan Freeman, you know. Ooh, now uh, I have to cast the book. That's going to be hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, he uh, finished his undergraduate studies at Earlham College and uh, completed a master's of theological studies degree at Harvard Divinity School and his PhD, um, as I said, here in May of 2020. He is currently an assistant professor of American studies at UVA. We hope we can uh, keep him here for a long time. Um, he certainly deserves to be. His specialties, as you know, uh, um, are American religious history uh, with a focus on religion and modernity and the religious left. Uh, those of you who are interested in the religious left and it's a fascinating story um, may want to, indeed, you do want to keep an eye on his uh, course uh, that is on uh, offer in the spring of 2021. He's particularly interested, uh, as you know, in the study of pacifism, religion, and law, and how religious groups respond to the pressures of secularization. Um, this dissertation, God Optional Religion, uh, focused on changing notions of God and the emergence of non-theistic perspectives within 20th century Quakerism, Unitarianism, and Reconstructionist Judaism. He has contributed to the Cambridge Companion to Quakerism, and he already is a, a published scholar. You can find um, one of his pieces in Peace and Change or in a journal called Religions. We'll be happy to supply those to you. Um, he is just an absolutely a brilliant uh, young scholar and um, exceedingly resourceful as a researcher. Um, I would be lost without him. Um, thanks uh, to you, um, Isaac, um, not only for your extraordinary work this semester, but also for um, you know, the, the thoughtful presentation that you um, have in store. So it's all yours. I will hope the presentation lives up to the great introduction. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be putting uh, putting on keynote here with screen share. So do let me know if like this drops out for you or you run into any problems because I can't actually see you because of the way keynote works when I turn on my slideshow. So do let me know if you run into any problems here. You can still hear me, right? We're all good. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. And you, you can see it says globalizing nonviolence and you're looking at the screen that says before and after camp. Yes. Yeah, we can see all that. That is a wonder in which all the technology works for me at one time. Okay, so this is good. We're halfway there. So glad to be with you all today and glad to be talking about nonviolence and thinking in particular about the religious origins of nonviolence, which is one of the major things that I'm interested in. So I want to start talking to you today uh, with this image here. This is uh, Franz Eichenberg. He's a uh, German-Jewish Quaker 
who was the illustrator for the Catholic worker. And so this is the peaceable kingdom from the book of Isaiah, literally the lion laying down with a lamp. And I think it's a good image to have as I begin my talk here today. So several weeks ago, a number of activists connected with what's called the Plowshares Movement were sentenced by a federal judge. So thus far, six of the so-called Plowshares Seven have been sentenced, and their sentences range from about 10 months to about 14 months in uh, federal prison. And the last of these activists is scheduled to be sentenced over in mid-December. And what they were convicted of was a number of different offenses, uh, depredation of government property, trespassing, and conspiracy. And that's how you get their, their sentences. Uh, and what happened, what caused them to be sentenced to these prison sentences in federal prison is on April 4th, 2018, the 50th anniversary of when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. These activists went uh, and cut a padlock in a Navy base and went through a fence to get into the Kings Point Naval Facility. And once they had gotten into that Naval Facility, they spilled blood. They'd actually taken blood from themselves. They drew it over a period of weeks to get enough blood to be able to do this. They sprayed that all over a wall um, um, in, on a naval insignia that was on that wall. And they spray painted an anti-war slogan on a walkway. Uh, they hung a banner that denounced the Trident missile. It's a nuclear missile system. And they had hammers with them that they had actually made themselves using melted down guns. So they symbolically melted down these guns in a forge and turned them into these hammers that they used to bang on a monument that was built in the naval base to nuclear warfare. And when they did this, they saw these actions as comparable to what Jesus does in the New Testament when he goes into the temple and he overturns the tables of the money changers. This is driving the money changers out of the temple. And Plowshares is a pretty interesting movement. It's a Christian pacifist organization. It's been deeply connected with the Catholic workers movement founded by Dorothy Day. Uh, the ultimate point is that they are religiously protesting the continued threat of nuclear weapons, and they see their actions as a symbolic way to stand against what they see as one of the greatest threats to humanity. And I'll, uh, let me play you a clip of these activists speaking here. Here's the statement that they made right before they entered the military base. The statement of the King's Bay Plowshares. We come in peace on this sorrowful anniversary of the martyrdom of a great prophet, the Reverend Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King. 50 years ago today, April 4th, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, as a reaction to his efforts to address the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. We come to King's Bay to answer the call of the prophet Isaiah, who said in chapter 2, verse 4, to beat swords into plowshares by disarming the world's deadliest nuclear weapon, the Trident submarine. We repent of the sin of white supremacy that oppresses and takes the lives of people of color here in the United States and throughout the world. We resist militarism that has employed deadly violence to enforce global domination. We believe rep reparations are required for stolen land, labor, and lives. Dr. King said, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is my own government, unquote. This remains true in the midst of our endless war on terror. The United States has embraced a permanent war economy. Peace through strength is a dangerous lie in a world that includes weapons of mass destruction on hair trigger alert. The weapons from one trident have the capacity to end life as we know it on planet Earth. Nuclear weapons kill every day through our mining, production, testing, storage, and dumping, primarily on indigenous native land. This weapon system is a cocked gun being held at the head of the planet. As white Catholics, we take responsibility to atone 
for the horrific crimes stemming from our complicity with the triplets. Only then can we begin to restore right relationships. We seek to bring about a world free of nuclear weapons, racism, and economic exploitation. We plead to our church to withdraw its complicity in violence and war. We cannot simultaneously pray and hope for peace while we bless weapons and condone war making. Pope Francis says abolition of weapons of mass destruction is the only way to save God's creation from destruction. Clarifying the teachings of our church, Pope Francis said, the threat of their use as well as their very possession is to be firmly condemned. Weapons of mass destruction, especially nuclear weapons, create nothing but a false sense of security. They cannot constitute the basis for peaceful coexistence between members of the human family, which must rather be inspired by an ethics of solidarity. Nuclear weapons eviscerate the rule of law, enforce white supremacy, perpetuate endless war and environmental destruction, and ensure impunity for all manner of crimes against humanity. Dr. King said, the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. We say, the ultimate logic of trident is omnicide. A just and peaceful world is possible when we join prayers with action. Swords into plowshares. So there you see the argument of the plowshares movement. Just from that video, four minutes long, you can detect a number of themes here. They're connecting racism and nuclear weapons, white supremacy and nuclear weapons. They have a statement about possession of land. So they've been very active on issues about um, for instance, justice for Native Americans and land rights. And here Plowshares is trying to combine all of these in a statement in, in their group, as you can see, of predominantly white Catholics, many of whom have had a lot of experience doing nonviolent direct action in a variety of settings. And I wanted to start with Plowshares today, uh, both because it's a contemporary movement, but also because it gets to many of the themes I wanna talk about. I want to tell you a bit about how Kenyan nonviolence is part of a wider religious tradition of nonviolence, one that I would argue predates the civil rights movement and that has taken different forms following King's death. And much of the story that I'm going to be telling you today is one part of what scholar Patricia Applebaum refers to as Protestant pacifist culture. And what I'm interested in is thinking about how denominations, religious communities in particular, that began as Protestants, uh, like Quakers, or those people who were involved in the Fellowship of Reconciliation, an organization that we talked a little bit about in this class and I'll talk about more today, grew to embrace nonviolent ideas and began to think of nonviolence in specific ways. They began to develop techniques of nonviolence. And I also want to gesture to the fact that what I'm broadly calling Kingian nonviolence here, has ended up in unexpected places. Here we have a group of Catholics embracing ideas of nonviolence that are used by King that come out of a tradition that is pretty heavily Protestant. Uh, we find nonviolence showing up in Latin America, in Egypt during the Arab Spring. Religious nonviolence was at its inception a widespread movement and it has continued to be widespread, even if as Taylor Branch argues, I think pretty persuasively, it's declined. And so my hope is that with my lecture here that I can sketch to you an intellectual genealogy of the movement in which King, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the civil rights movement is one particularly distinguished branch, but it is by no means the only branch of this wider phenomenon. So to start you out with uh, an image here, this, uh, this guy here is a Quaker. You can see he's dressed in the garb that you may know from the, uh, the cover of your oatmeal box. Your oatmeal box uh, for Quaker oats actually is a guy on it that's supposed to be William Penn. And so he's dressed in the traditional Quaker garb, which got discarded at the end of the 19th century. The reason I pulled this up is there's a lengthy Christian tradition of nonviolence 
Uh, it's been a part of a number of different Christian groups. So Anabaptists from their beginning uh, believed that Jesus's command in the Sermon on the Mount to resist not evil should be taken very literally. Uh, in another group, the Religious Society of Friends, which begins in the mid 17th century, also known as the Quakers, forbid violent action and warfare because they don't see them as in keeping with Jesus's directions. Violence was thought to have arisen from carnal and earthly causes. Violence is something that human beings should work to perfect themselves beyond. They should not engage in. They should not go to war if they're asked to go to war by states, right? That violates the commands of Christianity. They should not on an individual basis commit violence. And it's important to note that there are differences even within a Christian tradition of nonviolence. So groups like the Anabaptists traditionally have taken pacifism to mean that Christians should be separate from politics and worldly affairs. This is what's called the two kingdoms theology. It's an idea that there are two kingdoms in the world. There is Christ's kingdom, and then there is worldly affairs. And the ability to use force is relegated to that kingdom of the world. It is relegated to those that use the sword. But in the Anabaptist tradition, generally these are just two realms that don't mix. People who are Mennonites, who are uh, the group that eventually becomes the Amish, would teach that originally the idea is just that believers are supposed to go off to their own communities and not interfere with the rest of society. The price to living out a Christian life, to being nonviolent, is agreeing not to intervene in the wider world of politics. Quakers generally didn't believe this. And so this caused their philosophy of nonviolence to lead in some pretty interesting directions. How do you square being nonviolent with trying to change the world for the better, with trying to change politics in a direction that you think is gonna help bring about the kingdom of God? These are things that Quakers began to think about that began to be integrational to their philosophy of nonviolence. And so I wanted to highlight this guy in particular. This is Benjamin Lay. And Lay lived from 1681 to 1759. And he's very active as an abolitionist. He's one of the first people that we have on record as being opposed to slavery for its immediate end. Uh, and you may notice from the picture that Lay is interestingly proportioned. He was about four foot seven. He probably had what we would today call dwarfism. And he was often described by his contemporaries as a hunchback. And we know that he was married to a woman who suffered from a similar physical condition. Lay was born as a Quaker in England, moved to Jamaica where he opposed slavery. And upon moving uh, to Pennsylvania, Lay moved into what many people describe to as a cave. And in his cave, he began to live a rigorous ascetic lifestyle. And he was known for his commitment to ethical consumption. He would not use products that were produced by slaves, such as dyed clothing or sugar, because he worried that that would support slavery. He wouldn't use any product that required the death of an animal, which meant that he often went barefoot because he would refuse to wear leather shoes. And his vegetarian diet was pretty limited. In this time period, there's not a lot vegetarians can eat. And so he was known to eat mostly chestnuts, acorns, uh, boiled potatoes, milk, and water. And Lay started to do what we might today call nonviolent direct action to oppose slavery. So there are many stories of Lay's sort of outspoken activism. He, for instance, once attended a gathering of Quakers, concealing beneath his coat that he had a sword and a hollowed out Bible. And he filled that Bible with a bladder full of red pokeberry juice. And during the middle of this Quaker gathering, Lay stood up, announced that God would shed the blood of slaveholders for their sins, and he stabbed the Bible with the sword, which caused it to bleed red, right? Because it had that concealed bladder of pokeberry juice in it. It was a pretty dramatic demonstration of the sin of slavery. Lay's most notorious protest, though, was he abducted the son of one of his slaveholding neighbors who he concealed in his cave for a day to show those slaveholders how Africans felt when their children were kidnapped into slavery. 
the child was apparently unharmed at the end of this ordeal. In 1770, uh, 1737, Lay wrote a book called All Slave Keepers That Keep the Innocent in Bondage, Apostates Pretending to Lay Claim to the Pure and Holy Christian Religion. Real mouthful of a title, but it was the first anti-slavery text published in North America. And as you can imagine, Lay elicited some pretty strong reactions, uh, even among Quakers themselves, but he inspired a future generation of activists he had a kind of radicalism that could be very dramatic while not necessarily being violent. His ideas included the idea that you should boycott goods or services as part of a witness against an unjust practice and the idea of using theatricality as part of a demonstration against a political action or some kind of oppression that you thought to be wrong. Lay was willing to be mocked he was hated by certain people, and many people thought he was crazy, but he laid a groundwork for a kind of activism that people in later generations would pretty directly take up. I wanted to give you a picture of this guy here. This is William Lloyd Garrison. And the 19th century, quite a bit after LA, saw abolitionists increasingly embrace Christian nonviolence in the US and Britain as a key tactic. Garrison, who's pictured here, was the editor of an abolitionist paper, The Liberator, and he exerted such an influence on American nonviolence in particular that adherence to Christian nonviolence were sometimes spoken of as being Garrisonians, just like we might speak of people adhering to King's philosophy of nonviolence, right? In the 19th century, people would speak of Garrisonian nonviolence as the entire description of that philosophy. It's important to note though, and we talked a bit about this last class, that Garrison's ideas had some pretty substantial differences from King. Garrison was a firm believer in what Professor Marsh described last week as non-resistance. This is a kind of nonviolence that generally tries to avoid uh, too provocative demonstrations, uh, and it tries to avoid direct action. At times, Garrison could get a bit theatrical, but he generally thought that you weren't supposed to engage in practices that, for instance, would get you arrested. For Garrison, non-resistance and abolition were about behaving virtuously and being morally upright. And one thing he didn't concern himself very much with was the idea that nonviolence should be practical, that it should work. Garrison did what he felt was morally right, and he did that regardless of what the political consequences were. Famously, for instance, he burned the constitution, which he regarded as a pact with the devil because it upheld slavery and its provisions. And Garrison refused to vote because he viewed the act of voting as engaging in electoral politics as a compromise with the slave system. Abolitionists in the United States actually fractured in two because of Garrison's desire to do right at all costs led to him rejecting the idea of creating political parties to engage in electoral politics. And it led him to support women's rights. Other abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, who's a former protege of Garrison, argued that abolitionists needed to be involved in politics. They couldn't afford to be idealists. And someone like Douglass thought they even had to work with people they might find reprehensible, people like anti-immigration activists, nativists who are opposed to the Irish coming into the United States. If that meant that anti-slavery candidates would be elected. Many abolitionists also came to believe that publicly supporting women's equality, a position that Garrison held, was, would harm the political cause of abolition. And so, these abolitionists created their own organizations that excluded women from leadership, and they began to organize what ultimately became the Republican Party. My point here is that much of the groundwork for what would become Kingian nonviolence exists as early as the 1850s. There are differences in tactics, but many of the theoretical assumptions here are similar, and it's being directly deployed by the 1850s to speak to the American conflicts over race, in this case, over slavery. 
And many of the debates that people were raising about nonviolence are also similar. There are key questions. Is nonviolence required for Christian believers? Does it work to achieve social change? Should you keep adhering to nonviolence, even if it doesn't seem to be working? Or should you go to more expedient methods? What's the connection between nonviolence and practical politics? These are all questions that come up again in the 1960s, but these are questions that exist even in a century prior. Worth noting that when I'm saying that there's a genealogy here, that these ideas continue on, sometimes they continue on more literally than just ideas. So this is uh, Oswald Garrison Villard, the grandson of William Lloyd Garrison. I'm not going to talk too much about him, but he's one of the founders of the NAACP, the NAACP being an organization made up of uh, both uh, whites and blacks getting together to argue for the cause of African-American rights. And he directly cites in his decision to found the NAACP, this heritage that he's receiving from his uh, maternal grandfather, William Lloyd Garrison here. So these connections, there are connections about ideas, but sometimes they're pretty li like lineal. People are involved in families that have been a part of nonviolent movements for huge extended periods of time. To continue on, Garrison's ideas weren't forgotten in the United States after the Civil War, but they flourished uh, perhaps most visibly abroad. Probably the most articulate person to take up nonviolence as a cause in the late 19th century is the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy. And Tolstoy found himself unconvinced by much of Christian metaphysics. Uh, he was deeply unhappy with the Orthodox Church, which he saw as compromising itself with the czarist regime, with the state, with behaving uh, in ways that he thought were completely against how Christians should behave. And he began to believe that the purpose of life was to bring about the kingdom of God through living an ethical life according to Jesus's teachings. And among the most importance of these teachings, he began to think, was the idea of resisting not evil, of not returning violence with violence, and of being what we would today call a pacifist, although that's a word that really only comes into being in the 20th century. In 1893, Tolstoy wrote a book on this subject, and it was called The Kingdom of God is Within You. It's an extremely important book. I think I've got a rather distinctive looking copy here. I'll over here. The Kingdom of God Within You uh, starts by talking about Quakers and William Lloyd Garrison, and it gives you a history of all these thinkers who were involved in nonviolence. And he goes into a huge number of thinkers, probably more than we'd have time, even if the entire subject of this class was nonviolence. He talks about Aidan Ballou, a 19th century advocate of nonviolence in the US. He talks about different religious groups. He goes back to the first Christians. And the point of all of this is to provide an extended explanation about how non-resistance, non-violence is a core part of Christianity. And Tolstoy did try to live out these convictions. Uh, in some ways, it's pretty controversial when he did this. He abandons his family for a time who was wandering through Russia uh, as an ascetic. Um, but he also engages in political action to advance this cause of non-resistance. He tried to help a pacifist religious sect known as uh, the Dukabors immigrate away from Russia to reach places where they could be safe, where they wouldn't be repressed by the Russian government. Many of them actually end up in Canada in part because of Tolstoy's intervention. And from Tolstoy, who's, as you can probably guess, the guy on the left, these ideas ended up in different places. They ended up everywhere. Tolstoy is an incredibly successful author. His ideas were held up in intellectual circles as being important, being worth knowing. And so people start adapting them. And so this here is Tolstoy Farm in South Africa in 1910, over on the right-hand side of the screen. And it was established during Gandhi's struggle for Indian rights in South Africa. And it served 
uh, as a prototype ashram uh, for Gandhi. It was the space where Gandhi began to think about what it would mean to live in community with other people, how you could try and construct a community with a minimum of repression. So Tolstoy Farm, for instance, rejected the use of servants. Everybody who was an adult was supposed to labor on Tolstoy Farm, living together. And the name is because of the intellectual de uh, debt that Gandhi felt towards Leo Tolstoy, that he felt he was directly inheriting these ideas, directly bringing them to fruition with this project. Gandhi was particularly inspired by the kingdom of God is within you. And Tolstoy also had another text he called A Letter to a Hindu in which he talked about nonviolence and the possible use of nonviolence in trying to challenge colonialism. And so Gandhi began after reading Tolstoy to search for other resources that would help him engage in nonviolence, that would help him ground nonviolence in his own Hindu tradition. He found the writings of John Ruskin uh, really useful to this. He looked at Hindu texts. Uh, so for instance, he reads, uh, I'll mispronounce this, the Kareel, which is um, uh, a text that's originally uh, written in uh, Sanskrit. And he searched for intellectual resources and nonviolence that would help him formulate a clear way to talk about this. And Gandhi eventually begins to articulate his own views of nonviolence uh, as being what he called satyagraha. And it becomes one of the key parts of the Indian independence movement, one of the key ways that people are struggling against British colonial rule. It's worth noting though, that even in Tolstoy Farm, right, where most of the inhabitants here are of Indian descent, and this is the trajectory is leading it into the Indian independence movement, this is always an international effort. It's always got an international character. Nonviolence throughout this story I'm telling is got people from many nations uh, connected together. So Tolstoy Farm was originally owned by uh, Herman Karlbeck. Herman Karlbeck is actually the guy right next to Gandhi towards the center of this picture. He's in the, this sitting on the stone wall. And he was a Lithuanian Jew who was living in South Africa, who donated the farm, moved into the farm, and he and Gandhi shared a house together while living there. And I think it's really fascinating to think about here we've got a Hindu leader rooming with someone who is Jewish in a building named after a Russian Christian. This is a movement that is spreading everywhere it's traveling countries, and it's doing some surprising things. To move forward, World War I brings Christian nonviolence uh, into a sort of new level of importance. People have to figure out how to navigate nonviolence in relation to one of the greatest conflicts the world has ever known. And this right here is an image of uh, an ambulance that's connected with the Quakers. During World War I, uh, American Quakers in particular are searching for a way that Quaker men can do some form of alternative service. They don't want Quaker men who are drafted in the military to have to serve in the military. The military is offering them few options. So one of the things the Quakers develop is the idea that maybe they could engage in constructive war during the time of military service, helping to rebuild France, serving as ambulance workers on the front line to try and treat all sides of this conflict, providing medical care for people, giving food to the needy. And they create what's called the American Friends Service Committee. And it actually works with British Quakerism, which has a British Friends Service Committee to try and operate in France. Ultimately, this idea doesn't work quite as well as they had hoped. The US government actually won't let Quaker men get out of the draft. Many of them end up in prison instead, and it won't furlough them to do this kind of constructive work. So the people that do end up in France tend to be people who are above draft age or women. Um, but the organization itself has some real successes despite not getting the population that they wanted. And so they, after World War I ends, they end up keeping the American Friends Service Committee. And what it does ends up radically expanded. 
In the period after World War I, it provides a huge amount of food aid to Germany. Germany is a defeated power. Uh, few people are willing to feed the starving German population. And so uh, by the end of the war, uh, the Quakers step up and start providing large amounts of foodstuffs. And between 1920 and 1924, about one quarter of the German children uh, that are alive, basically one quarter of all German children, receive one of their meals through the Quaker relief effort in Germany. The American Friends Service Committee, this organization doing this relief is also doing other things. It goes over and it provides famine relief in Russia. It begins to operate in France. So in France, it tries to rebuild houses. It's involved in construction work there. They begin to realize that there might be a need for an organization doing this kind of work in the United States. And so the AFSC begins to extend its work into uh, the coal fields of Pennsylvania in which uh, there are mine worker strikes going on. People are not engaged in coal mining because they're on strike. The AFSC provides food relief. All of this is connected to an idea that being nonviolent is supposed to require being engaged with the world. It's supposed to require you to do something to further the cause of peace, to try to eliminate injustice. And so the way that Quakers are going about that is they're creating an institution that's supposed to institutionally fix these problems. It's supposed to do something about it practically. Just to talk a little more about the AFSC, these are two of the leaders of that group. Over on the right is Clarence Pickett. Clarence Pickett was the director of the AFSC, ran it day to day. He's the person that when it comes to figuring out how to get the food from point A to point B, actually makes that happen. Uh, when the AFSC established work camps in which college students would go off to work to try and benefit the cause of peace, he figured out where those camps would be located, had them laboring in different kinds of communities. Over on the left is probably the more important figure, and this is Rufus Jones. He's a philosophy professor at Haverford College. It's a small Quaker school right outside Philadelphia. And Rufus Jones is probably the most important Quaker of the 20th century. He wrote about the idea that Quakerism was a mystical religion, and he began to discuss how each individual you know, possessed a measure of divine light, how this meant that every individual had a sense of worth. So he's taking traditional Quaker ideas and he adapts them for the 20th century in new ways. And he wrote well over 50 books, gave a huge number of speeches, including at places you may have heard of like University of Virginia. And he was a massive celebrity for his time. Rufus Jones was a guy who every person on the street probably would have at least have heard the name. His books sold huge numbers of copies. And he was involved in co-founding the American Friends Service Committee and served as its honorary chairman. And whenever the AFSC needed permission to work abroad, they would use Jones as their sort of ambassador to get the right to work in Germany, to try and get the door open in Soviet Russia to keep providing this kind of aid. This influence that I'm talking about, the kind of effect that Jones was having, the kind of effect the AFSC was having, has some pretty direct implications for the civil rights movement. You may recognize this guy, this is Howard Thurman. And Thurman was a student of Jones. Howard Thurman graduated from Warhouse College. He had been to seminary at Rochester Theological Seminary. He had worked as a minister. Um, and while he was working as a minister, he encountered Rufus Jones's writing. And uh, he uh, was also actually working as a professor at the time as well. And he found himself so moved that he gave up this position of being a minister. Um, he gave up being a professor at Morehouse and Spelman Colleges where he was working and moved for a year to Haverford College to study mysticism with Jones in 1929 as a special student, right? He's an adult, he's somebody that had already had a degree, but he still studies with Jones to try and wrap his head around these ideas about nonviolence, these ideas about each individual 
having a divine light and a sort of divine sense of worth. And Thurman would go on to be a really prominent individual in a number of different ways. So he founds the Church of the Fellowship of All People in San Francisco in 1944, one of the first really interracial churches that exists. It's a space that is designed to bring Black and white congregants together. It is made with the idea that Christianity is a religion that should cross racial lines. In 1947, Thurman also writes a really important text called Jesus of the Disinherited. And it's a powerful book about how the message of Jesus should speak especially to the marginalized, how the people who are in the most oppressed positions in society have special, um, basically a special message within Christianity. And that book also argues that nonviolence could be a way to constructively change society to help those who are oppressed, that that could be what Christians are called to do is use nonviolence to try and remold society to make it more just. In 1953, he would actually become the dean of the chapel at Boston University. This is a big deal for a number of reasons. He's dean at a chapel at a school that is a white school, right? He's an African-American man. Um, and this is also the final year that Martin Luther King was there. And Thurman knew King's family from before his time there. Yeah. So another reason that Thurman is a really important figure is in 1953, uh, he becomes dean of the chapel at Boston University. And this is during King's last year there. And Thurman knew King from before the time that King went to Boston University for his doctorate. He was a friend with King's father. He'd been to King's family home. Um, but this is also King is meeting Thurman at a different point in his life. And King was also aware of Jesus of the disinherited. And so these are ideas that do pass from one person to another. None of this is to say that Thurman doesn't have a ton of different intellectual influences going on, right? He's not just taking all his ideas from Rufus Jones. He's not saying King is taking all his ideas from Thurman, but we can trace some of these ideas as going back into a tradition. Everyone's being welded as a tactic is developing, is becoming something that people are beginning to use and what will become the civil rights movement. And these religious ideas also change as they pass from person to person. They're being forged over time in radically different environments, right? Tolstoy is not speaking to the same things that Howard Thurman is, and they're being adapted to each person's needs. They're being changed to fit each person's specific requirements. The American Friends Service Committee also uh, is engaged in perhaps more direct work on the civil rights movement. Uh, and I talked a little bit about this in this class prior to now. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, the American Friends Service Committee had a direct program on race relations. In the 1920s, the AFSC, this Quaker organization, was convinced that the way to eliminate racism, which they began to see as a sin, was to try and educate whites in particular. They thought that racism was mostly a product of ignorance. Uh, and so they created what they called the interracial section of the AFSC to promote racial cooperation, to address what they saw as these concerns, which they saw as a threat to, to peace, to have building the kingdom of God. And in the 1920s, the AFSC hired Crystal Bird um, she's not a Quaker. She's a young woman from uh, right outside Philadelphia. She later uh, marries and becomes Crystal Bird Fawcett. And she gave speeches. And when I say she gave speeches, that's sort of underselling what she did. She spoke incredibly widely. So we know that in 1928 alone, she spoke at 200 plus speaking engagements at various colleges and universities and churches um, and had an audience of probably around 50,000 people. Right, so many people are listening to Crystal Bird. And you can take a look here, I'll zoom in, and you can get a sense of some of the things uh, uh, that 
she's speaking about. So she, this is a pamphlet that's telling you what you could get Crystal Bird to speak to your community group on. Here are some of her themes, right? Some of her themes include things like, uh, she's got one which is Negro spirituals, their inner significance, thinking about music. Is there a race problem? Crystal Bird would tell you like, yes, there is a race problem in the United States. And we'll explain that to a group that in the 1920s, a white group might not actually think there is, particularly in the North. So yeah, Howard Thurman, this is Crystal Bird. And then you can see some of the subjects on this pamphlet of Crystal Bird. And I'm talking about on the right, that's what I was talking about of the subjects that she's addressing. And you can see here, there are different blurbs by people extolling why you might wanna have Crystal Bird show up for her, your community group. So for instance, Sophia Lyon Fawes is a major figure on the religious left. She's heavily involved in Unitarian circles. You can see now, right? It's working? Yes. Yes, Thank good, okay. If it drops out, let me know. Okay, so Crystal Bird, but there are issues with this. By the 1930s, the AFSC begins to find that the idea of just educating people that racism is a problem, educating them out of racism like isn't working. And so they create what they call the Institute of Race Relations at Swarthmore College, which is designed to provide uh, a way to academically study race in the classroom, the spur change outside of it. And the Institute of Race Relations, or IRR as it's called, begins to conceive of racism as a systematic problem, as a political problem, as a cultural problem. And this is, doesn't entirely match how we talk about this today, but it has at least many of the seeds of ways that people in the civil rights era and later are gonna think about racism, that it's not something that is simply a result of ignorance. It's important to note that there are some real problems with these programs. They're all managed by white Quaker administrators, uh, though they aim for a diverse staff. Um, but they did lay an organizational structure uh, down that would provide training to many people who would later take part in the civil rights movement. And it's important to note that we're also talking about this in the context of civil rights. There's also a separate program that's specifically doing outreach to uh, the Japanese, bringing over Japanese students. Uh, and during the Second World War, the uh, AFSC suspends most of its operations uh, in the IRR to focus mostly on trying to fight uh, Japanese internment, which doesn't end up working. Uh, but they are able to get a significant amount of Japanese uh, American college students let out to go to various colleges. Outside of Quakerism in this period, we're still talking the wake of War I, the 1920s, new violence or nonviolence seemed to take on a new kind of urgency. And this is Sherwood Eddy. He was a major leader in the YMCA and he'd done extensive uh, missions work in India. Eddie is the guy on the left over on the right is Sun Yat Sun, who becomes uh, one of the leaders of China. And Eddie began to raise real questions about whether really Christians needed to evangelize at all, particularly when India and other nations seem to have as much to offer Christians as Christianity had to offer them. And so Eddie began to increasingly devote himself to engaging in peace work. Uh, and he would begin to lead what would be called Sherwood Eddy tours in Europe and India, in which ministers and other leaders uh, would go on these tours to learn about the causes of violent conflict, to think about the ways in which um, you, they should work to reduce violent conflict. And Eddie wrote a whole number of books on this. This one here uh, that I'm showing up at the camera is Revolutionary Christianity. Um, which, if you read it, I think strikes a pretty modern sounding tone on many of these questions, uh, thinking about the need to address social injustices to work towards a more peaceful world. This guy here is Richard Gregg. Um, Richard Gregg is the guy on the left. Uh, and Richard Gregg, after graduating from Harvard Law School uh, and working for a bit as a lawyer, found that he just could not managed to be a lawyer ethnic, uh, ethically. He thought that being a lawyer was such an ethical strain that he quit, went to India, thought about how he could try and 
live a more moral life and fell into the orbit of Gandhi. And he lived in Gandhi's ashram. And while there, he published a large number of books. He had books that addressed subjects like the economics of the ashram, talking about Gandhi's use of handcrafts as an alternative to capitalism. He had books on the psychology of Gandhi and nonviolence. Greg began to think that Gandhi offered a method that people in the United States and in Western Europe could use and adapt to fight injustices in their own countries. That not only was this useful as an anti-colonial measure against the British, but that he could teach people how to do a little of what Gandhi was doing transform it from a Hindu specific vocabulary, take it out of this context in India, and that it could be used in other places. In 1934, Greg published what became his most important work. And this is a text called The Power of Nonviolence. And it was based heavily, or heavily on his early work, but this time it was phrased as a sort of manual. How could you practice nonviolence? And Greg began to describe nonviolence as a tool that people could use. And it was immediately embraced by a bunch of different people. Uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a pacifist group established during World War I immediately embraced this as a key text. The Christian Century, one of the main magazines of mainline Protestantism, hailed it as a brilliant set of tactics. And Rufus Jones, the founder of the American Friends Service Committee, wrote the foreword. And in the book, Greg describes nonviolence as what he says is a kind of moral jujitsu, that not striking back is a technique that can disarm an opponent, that can win sympathy and support from other people. It's not a perfect method. It's not a guaranteed way to win. But in any conflict, you're not guaranteed a way to win. And Greg began to believe that nonviolence had a higher probability of winning a victory than military force did, and it required less resources. So here you can see uh, this section where he says, nonviolent acts as a kind of moral jujitsu. And he describes this as essentially like, it's like a martial art. You have to throw your opponent off balance using nonviolence, and then you can take the initiative and define a situation for yourself. And it's worth observing that the revised edition in 1960, the second edition of The Power of Nonviolence, swaps the foreword by Rufus Jones for a new foreword by a figure gaining in popularity in the time, Martin Luther King Jr., whose glowing praise appears on this front cover, talking about the importance of Richard Gregg's work. Obviously very interesting. I'm trying to type names and get the spellings correct as I go, just for notes, and that's very difficult sometimes. Um, I guess how, um, I know very little about the Quakers and it's it's fascinating to see kind of their, the, the intellectual history and how that's had these major impacts on these very famous figures. Um, but I don't see Quakers or Quakerism as, maybe like a powerful political group today. So do you think that they're a force to be reckoned with in the political arena or is it more just their ideas have borne fruit in these other figures? Really waned since the Great 60s. Question. So I mean, early America, so if you're talking early American history, it's worth pointing out that Quakers are, I believe, the third largest religious group up until uh, really like 1820s. So if you're talking early America, Quakers are incredibly important and into the 19th century, they're like a very noticeable group. So if you're talking William Lloyd Garrison, the lead up to the Civil War, it would be hard not to notice that Quakers are there. They're just such a massive presence. Um, until like really the 1960s, they're really just an observable presence pretty, uh, pretty much everywhere. It's worth pointing out that there are two Quakers elected president one on the back of this kind of relief work. So Herbert Hoover's entire early career is engaging in this kind of relief work in the wake of World War I. He runs American relief efforts in, the, uh, in Britain. Everyone thinks he's gonna be this great president because he's like super good at relief work. It turns out that he's like actually a really terrible president, but like he's elected partially on the strength of this reputation. 
The other one is Richard Nixon, which is like really weird to think about, but there are two people elected from a really small religious group. And I mean, both of them tout this Quaker connection, although how um, Nixon is part of a far more evangelical branch of the denomination than the people I'm talking about. But they're like, they're very politically influential up really, I would say until the end of the Vietnam War, um, more than you'd think. Certainly more than numbers would suggest. And when it comes to nonviolence, um, there's a scholar named Patricia Applebaum that wrote this book on Protestant pacifist culture that sort of chronicles all of the sort of intellectual world that these people lived in, the plays that they were making, really leading up to the civil rights movement. And she's got this observation that's like Quakers seem to be like everywhere in here. And it's like sort of hard to disentangle this movement from Quakerism. There are non-Quakers in it, but they're heavily involved with Quakers in some way. Uh, and there are a lot of people who aren't formally members of Quakers who kind of hang out with Quakers a lot um, to the point where Quakers actually create a category of membership called the wider Quaker fellowship that's much larger than the actual denomination in like the 1920s and has like a huge number of people more than the actual group. They keep trying to recruit Gandhi to it, but Gandhi never joined. Uh, I have a really like, um, it's like a opinion question, but um, so like when I was reading about like the Black Lives Matter um, movement and seeing all the protests and whatnot, and also hearing about like the rioting and the looting, um, like I wanted to ask like, do you think that nonviolence is sufficient enough to garner change? Because when I was reading like the articles like that, they said like, you know, when you have an oppressed group like that, it's only natural that, you know, things like that would happen. So this is me soapboxing. I think that like nonviolence is like a fairly effective method and people tend to vastly underrate it. There's a lot of work done on, not a lot, but more than you'd think done on thinking about nonviolence as a tactic. Um, and uh, one of the things that we'll talk a bit about towards the end of this presentation is like, you can use this in a bunch of different things. You can use it in some causes that I might not think are that politically righteous in which it can still be pretty effective. Um, and um, I, I do think one thing that's worth keeping in mind in much of this literature is that people who write about this as a strategy will point out that military force like often doesn't work. If you think of any military conflict, you've got two sides and one of those sides is going to lose and not achieve their objectives. And if you're holding that up as the sort of model of like, well, you've got violent force and you've got nonviolent force, uh, the record of people engaged in protracted nonviolent struggles with a disciplined group of people is like way better than the level of people engaged in like partisan warfare. Like engaging in a guerrilla warfare, high chance, particularly against someone more powerful than you that you're going to lose. And if you're weighing like, what are my two options? I'm going to engage in like urban guerrilla tactics of like throwing Molotov cocktails at like, you know, like a tank versus I'm going to like engage in a strike. That strike has a much more high probability of achieving a concrete political end than like the urban guerrilla warfare. Um, it's not an absolute. I do think that anyone that tells you that holds this in a religious view that thinks that because they're using the right kind of nonviolence, that means that they inherently win any conflict they're not right. Like it's clear that, and one of the reasons I like Greg and I think Greg's important to this is one of Greg's points about this is that this is like a strategy that you run like a military strategy. And he compares this to war. And he says like, if you do it right, you have a higher probability of success, but like that doesn't mean that you're gonna win every single time. And if you're not disciplined, you'll also like, there's no point in doing this because you need to have a group of people who can keep this, which is a pretty tough discipline. Um, I have a question, um, and it returns back to the topic of Quakers. And maybe this is like an attempt to connect two completely separate ideas, but do you yeah. see any through line or connection between um, the Quakers' original principles of like religious freedom and their ability to integrate their uh, like culture of nonviolence into like certain cultures in America? So like that principle of religious freedom being able to transcend religious lines and into culture? Hmm, that's in, yeah, I mean, well, there, there are competing tendencies within Quakerism. There's like certainly an, 
uh, an awareness that other people have some kind of religious truth and that's good. But then for much of their history, Quakers also dress distinctively, refuse to marry outside the group and keep to their own very specific theology while believing literally anyone who does engage in that is a heretic um, and like less than a true Christian. Uh, and they're really competing impulses. And the combination of the two actually may be sort of effective for nonviolence. So the Quakers developed a very distinctive sense of identity of themselves, right? That being Quaker is like really important. They give up the dress, they give up the restrictions on marriage, but people are still very anchored to it. Much like we might think of people of like Jewish descent are anchored to like being Jewish transcends the sort of theological implications. It's like a group connection. And that makes it much easier to engage in things like nonviolence because you've got that collective sense of identity like it would betray the principles of not just theology like the intellectual edifice but the very essence of being um, and at the same time the openness to being willing to consider other people having some kind of truth means that they're open to talking to Gandhi um, Tagore is another big figure the Indian poet who plays pretty heavily in these circles um, and engaging with people who are um, in some cases, they're of different religious groups who are Jewish in the US. Uh, in some cases, they're secular, but they have very little desire to convert. They're pretty like satisfied with their own identity like by the early 20th century and really proud of it, um, but not really interested in sort of bringing it to other people in any kind of uh, evangelistic way, if that makes any sense. Does that answer your question at all? Should I continue for a bit? We'll get us past World War II. May I ask just what, yeah, I mean, this is well, terrific. May I just ask one question? Me. Going uh, back to- oh. I'll assume you can hear me. If you can't hear me, do holler. Can you hear me? You guys hear, oh, can you hear me, guys? Isaac, can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Just going back really quickly to um, this yeah. character, Benjamin Lay. Yeah. Uh, and And his, Embrace of theatricality. I, I I love that attribute, and I I just like to hear more about what that means in terms of his repertoire of, you know, political and social engagement. Theatricality. Uh oh. Did you hear that? I heard Benjamin Lay. What something means? What was the thing? Theatric, can you guys hear me? Theatricality. Theatricality. Yes, and simply what that means in terms of part of his repertoire, a strategic aspect of his repertoire yeah, I mean, of engagement. Uh, it's hard to know what Lay thought is. You did you you did that uh, freezy thing again? Not you, but um. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, theatricality. Um, it's hard to know. So Lay would have argued that every single direction he got was a direction direct from God. So Lay would have interpreted all of this as their divine leadings. It's what God told me to do. God told me to poke the thing, like the Bible full of the pokeberry juice to spray the blood everywhere. Um, on the other hand, like Lay is involved in a whole bunch of circles in which uh, he's with people who have sort of a interest in theater and performance. Right. Uh, ben Franklin publishes his book um, and he's like, he's buddies with Ben Franklin, which is kind of an odd combination if you think of the two of them together. And so he's, he's clearly aware that people view these kinds of acts as generating notoriety, getting a lot of attention. Uh, and some of these are more minor than the ones I've listed. Like he goes and he smashes a, a tea set at one point in a market square to protest against uh, slave, uh, the fact that sugar is uh, basically uh, farmed using slaves. So I've, I've, I've often thought, um, and I'm sorry we didn't talk about this more in the movement, um, context of the civil rights movement, that like one of the forgotten um, techniques of social protest is is pranksterism, and I, I just I, I wonder if we could call Lay one of the pioneers of, of of pranksterism as a way of exemplifying um, 
politically oppressive forces and you know creating these kind of kinds of public spaces in which those are um, theatrically enacted, if you will. Yeah, I mean, if you think of Abby Hoffman trying to uh, levitate the Pentagon, like one of the things with that is like he's kind of more serious than he lets on. Um, and it's like Lay with a pokeberry juice knows he's faking it, but he also does think that the like the Bible is going to spray blood on slaveholders because they're all they're all damned. Um, so that's you know there is both of them are walking that line between what is prophetic revelation and what is sort of just the the fun of getting a group of people to be shocked at you. Hey, thanks. So um, uh, carry on. I will. I will do so. Uh, and again, if I have any you have any problems hearing or seeing let me know uh okay here we go back to it okay um so we broke around the second world war here and the second world war proved really difficult for believers in nonviolence. and some of them concluded that the nazis were the ultimate threat basically and that therefore they should discard all of these nonviolent ideas and convictions and fight hitler um, and there were often regular defectors from pacifism throughout its history. There are people who spend a few years in this nonviolent movement and leave. Um, we could mention Reinhold Niebuhr, a theologian, being the person who's very early on is a member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He's a pacifist. And then by the late 1930s, he just hates pacifists more than almost anything else. And World War II was really important, not only because it forced some pacifists away from movement, but it also forced people who were involved as followers of nonviolence to decide what they wanted to do. Men in particular who believed in nonviolence had to decide what action they should take if they were going to refuse military service, and they had really two options. They could do unpaid labor for the U.S. government uh, in quasi-military camps that were actually run by religious denominations, um, and sometimes this was doing useful work like fighting forest fires or clearing out uh, flammable brush, but often it was doing absolutely useless labor like breaking rocks just in order to keep busy um, and as a punishment for not serving in World War II. Or they could decide that they weren't gonna take part in these camps. They could decide that any compromise with the government uh, would make them complicit in violence and they could go to prison. This is the more extreme option. And there are a decent number of men that chose that option. So over on the right-hand side of this screen, that's a location of all the civilian public service camps in the United States. These are camps where men would engage in labor if they agreed to go to these quasi-military style setups to do labor for the federal government. Over on the left is a pamphlet basically advocating for people to join the civilian public service if they're pacifists, that they're going to engage in service without weapons. Sorry, but it looks like they're half dozen or so in Virginia. Do you know anything about those locations? Uh-oh. Every time I ask a question, something bad happens. Yeah, half dozen in Virginia. Yeah, most of those are in Shenandoah. Yeah, no worries. Most of the ones in Virginia are connected to Shenandoah. And so we, uh, we could think of them working, a lot of them work in former civilian conservation corps camps uh, around Shenandoah. Um, and so like when you're in Shenandoah Park, you should think of these guys because they were involved in helping clear the park, build the trails. And in places like Virginia, they actually have a lot more useful labor than some of the other spots. Okay, it's worth pointing out that uh, the men that go to prison actually have a pretty substantial role in the developing civil rights movement. So these are protesters outside Danbury prison. This is actually after World War II was ended, but many objectors to war were sent to Danbury prison, which was a federal prison uh, during the conflict. And one of the things that happened in Danbury is Danbury was at that time, like many federal government facilities, a segregated facility. The dining hall in particular would not allow black and white inmates to mix. They were supposed to seat at, sit at separate tables. They were uh, led into the dining hall at separate times. And these men who objected to war and were taking part in this nonviolence movement thought that this was absolutely incomprehensible. Most of the men who are objectors to war who are part of this nonviolent movement are white, although not exclusively. 
Uh, and in Danbury, they actually got together and they engaged in uh, what started as a work strike that lasts 135 days and then becomes a hunger strike. And during the time that they're striking, most of the men involved in the strike are actually sent into administrative segregation, what we would call solitary confinement by the warden at Danbury. Uh, but in the end, ultimately, they win. The warden eventually relents. He's really worried that these guys are going to kill themselves in the course of their hunger strike. Uh, he figures that this is not really that big a deal for him. He doesn't personally care. Uh, and they desegregate the dining facility. And it's a remarkable incident because Danbury is actually the first federal government facility to desegregate its dining facility. And it's because of these objectors to war that are in Danbury causing that to happen. And they work with some people that we might not think of as the most active group on civil rights. They work with the Jehovah's Witnesses who are a heavily interracial group and want to be able to sit together. And it's an interesting combination of these different groups of people, these nonviolent resistors, these Jehovah's Witnesses coming together in the prison in order to basically force the prison to desegregate. This is a photograph of where essentially this many of these men end up. Uh, it's a photograph of the journey of reconciliation in 1947. And the journey of reconciliation was a bus trip organized uh, as a joint effort between the Congress of Racial Equality, which is a spin-off of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. It's three Fellowship of Reconciliation members get together to create an organization dedicated principally to racial justice and the Fellowship of Reconciliation itself. It's a co-sponsored activity. And the journey of reconciliation's point was that it sent a team of riders on Greyhound and Trailways buses down to the South to test the Supreme Court's uh, banning of segregation on uh, interstate bus travel, uh, whether in fact they would be allowed to travel down as an integrated group on those buses or they would be stopped. And they, they knew that they would face very substantial amounts of violence during this. And I wanna point out uh, two men in particular pictured here. Um, so towards the middle of this, you see the guy in the bow tie in the very back, it's Bayard Rustin. Uh, Rustin is a Quaker. He's a member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Uh, he was an employee of what's called the War Resisters League, a major pacifist organization. Uh, and later he's a gay activist. And Rustin's spiritual development, his sort of trajectory down this path was kickstarted when as a young man, he heard a lecture by Rufus Jones, that Quaker head of the AFSC, which led him to contemplate the place of nonviolence in his own life. During World War II, Rustin served a sentence in Lewisburg prison where he actually led uh, efforts in that prison against prison segregation. The other person I wanna talk to is um, about is the guy who is uh, over to the right of the guy in the top hat. He's sort of standing behind the guy with the suitcase. That's James Peck. And James Peck is the only person who took part in both the journey of reconciliation and what are the later Freedom Rides, a very similar effort in 1961. And Peck is a really fascinating figure because he was one of the leaders of the Danbury prison strike, which desegregated that dining facility. He was serving time in prison for his resistance to war. And he viewed this going on the journey of reconciliation as a natural extension of the work that he'd started while in prison. And this could be really dangerous. Uh, this is Peck after the Freedom Rides. Peck got beaten pretty badly um, in the 1960 trip. Um, and it's worth noting that these men all had to train themselves in nonviolence to be able to not respond to provocation. They knew that people were going to attack them. They actually went through exercises to train themselves not to respond. If people hit them, people yelled at them, being passive, in the face of violence is an incredibly tough thing to do. And you can see Peck suffered pretty badly for it physically, uh, although he survived and lived many years after this. It's worth observing just how influential uh, this kind of nonviolence ends up being for the civil rights movement itself. Um, when King starts the Montgomery bus boycotts, um, he's not really 
wedded entirely to this nonviolent philosophy. When the Montgomery bus boycotts begin, King has a gun under his pillow. He has armed guards in his house. Uh, it is because of um, a number of factors, but one of the larger ones is the arrival of two figures connected with the Fellowship of Reconciliation to come to talk to King about these issues. That he really begins to embrace nonviolence as a central part of the Montgomery bus boycott, as a central part of what becomes his stance in the civil rights movement. So one of the figures that leads King in this direction is Baird Rustin, who at that time is connected with the War Resisters League. He's working as an employee. He's sent down to work with King and he becomes a, a key advisor for King on just the organization of the civil rights movement. And this really peaks in 1963 when Rustin organizes the 1963 March on Washington where King gives the I Have a Dream speech. There are always some tensions there. Uh, Rustin is gay. King is aware he could be blackmailed on this. Uh, and eventually he, actually he is blackmailed uh, about this. Someone uh, uh, basically says that they'll allege that King and Rustin are gay. They're not, they're not in a relationship, but King eventually severs his connection with Rustin partially over this salvation. It's just so, too explosive. The other person connected to nonviolence that meets with King that persuades him to go down this nonviolent road as Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycott is starting is this guy over on the left that's Glenn Smiley. Glenn Smiley is the national campaign director for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And here he is with King on the first integrated bu uh, bus ride after the bus boycott has ended. This is the first ride in which they can ride together and he's been key advisor to King, and so here he is sitting on the bus. And King actually apparently gets a whole reading list from both Smiley and Rustin to begin to think about nonviolence and to figure out how to integrate this into his sermons, into his preaching, and in, into his lifestyle. So he's very consciously drawing on these resources in his own work and what becomes the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. One thing that I want to note, and those of you who have read the book by Sarah Azaransky and other, um, and other contexts, the one, uh, This Worldwide Struggle, thinking about uh, the interconnectedness of the civil rights movement internationally, may know this picture. Uh, it's on the cover of the book. But one of the things I want to drive home is that even in the King era, this movement was international. Advocates of nonviolence tended to connect their ideas to decolonization as it occurs. There's a long list of people that have pretty deep international connections. So Bayard Rustin, who's over in the middle here, talking to uh, um, Nehru, the prime minister of India, spent a substantial amount of time in India paid for by the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. And the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, this international branch of this pacifist group, actually requested that the American branch of the fellowship loan Rustin to them so he could work in India uh, in anti-colonialism efforts. And American Fellowship of Reconciliation declined viewing his work on the civil rights movement as too important to let him go. So he ends up going back to the United States, continues working on civil rights efforts domestically. Howard Thurman is another figure that spends a substantial amount of time in India uh, thanks to the student Christian movement, which funds his trip there. He meets with Gandhi. Um, Sarah Azaransky, who is the author of This Worldwide Struggle, I think makes a really compelling case that much of, uh, the, uh, much of the force behind Jesus of the Disinherited, the ideas in it, the impetus to write it, comes out of questions that Thurman finds get raised while on his trip to India to meet with Gandhi. Um, in part, because Thurman isn't entirely satisfied with Gandhi's answers when it comes to dealing with race in India or the United States, and he wants to provide his own answers. Polly Murray is an interesting example of somebody who never actually visits India, but is really influenced by Gandhi. Uh, Murray is an African-American civil rights advocate uh, a lawyer whose book, State Laws on Race and Color, was regarded as the legal Bible of the civil rights movement by Thurgood Marshall. And Murray later goes on to co-found the National Organization uh, for uh, Women and becomes one of the first ordained women in the Episcopal Church. And from her reading, uh, she really begins to regard Gandhi and Satyagraha as 
very personally important in how she conceives of her religious mission, how she conceives of her civil rights work. Um, and it becomes pretty foundational to the stuff she's doing, thinking about herself within this trajectory and this tradition, even though she's not going abroad to meet with people. Another thing that I want to highlight is that this movement goes beyond the bounds of civil rights. It doesn't just reach Martin Luther King and then become only about civil rights as King is engaged in civil rights activism. Other advocates activists are engaged in other kinds of reforms using nonviolent direct action, trying to use nonviolent tactics in order to be able to achieve clear ends. So this guy over here, uh, the one in the hat, is A.J. Musty. A.J. Musty is one of the leaders of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He has a really interesting career. Musty uh, begins his life uh, professionally as a Dutch reform minister, a strict Calvinist. He reads a bunch of stuff in the social gospel that leads him to eventually become a pacifist and he joins Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, but he begins to engage in work with unions. So he becomes a Quaker and he starts to work with labor unions in the textile industry in Massachusetts, but he finds that pacifism just isn't working for him. He, can't get it to achieve the ends that he wants. Uh, and he becomes a communist and actually uh, becomes a Trotskyist who meets with Trotsky to plot worldwide revolution at one point. Um, and after returning from a visit to meet with Trotsky to figure out how they can spread Trotskyism in the United States, Muskie walks into a church in France and he has a religious experience that converts him back to pacifism. He begins to think that the essence of being um, faithful, right? For him, this is more than Christianity, is to not harm others, to um, work towards building the kingdom of God. And he rejoins Fellowship of Reconciliation and becomes its leader. And he is one of the mentors that um, really helps train Bayard Rustin in the tactics of nonviolence. And what he's doing here in this really awkward looking photo is he's actually crossing a fence into a Nevada missile base uh, these are military police who he knows are going to arrest him, but this is part of his protest against nuclear weapons. And for Muskie, uh, the campaign against nuclear weapons became one of the main focuses of his later years. And he dies in 1967, right as he's beginning to focus on the Vietnam War as one of the primary things that he's opposed to. Uh, one of his main efforts at the very end of his life is trying to stop the draft and stop the war. And it's worth noting that nonviolent advocates have some success outside of the civil rights movement. Um, so one that I think is worth pointing out to you all is that in the 1950s, New York City would actually shut down periodically for civil defense drills. They would sound a siren. Every person in New York City was supposed to seek cover. It was a crime to not seek shelter and you were supposed to go to a fallout shelter if at all possible. And this was part of preparing for what people thought would be an inevitable nuclear conflict. And people connected to Fellowship of Reconciliation, these folks who were also involved in doing things like uh, the Journeys of Reconciliation, really disagreed. They thought that efforts to try and do civil defense drills um, made nuclear war seem survivable when it really wasn't. Uh, they argued that the existence of hydrogen weapons in particular meant that nobody in New York City was going to survive a nuclear attack from the Soviets. A hydrogen bomb is a thousand times more powerful than the nuclear weapons that killed Hiroshima. They pointed out that this was all just gave the illusion that it would be possible for people to fight a war and win it. And so Muskie and others actually refused to seek shelter in New York during these civil defense drills. And this is Fifth Avenue during these drills. So they would go out on the street in times like this, hold protests and they would be arrested. And they did this year after year after year. And the number of people involved in these protests grew. And New York ultimately got rid of the drills and they argued it was partially for economic reasons, but it also seems to have been driven by these protests, that these protests just were a real issue for New York to every year be hauling people off uh, because they would just stand out in, on public streets. Nonviolent advocates also were 
so committed to peace that some of them died for their convictions. So I just want to point out uh, really three examples that stand out here. Uh, in 1965, uh, on November 2nd, Quaker Norman Morrison went towards the Pentagon uh, carrying his baby daughter with a jug of kerosene. Uh, and he soaked himself in the kerosene, lit a match, handed his baby daughter off to someone else, uh, and uh, burned himself to death. And this was part of a protest uh, that Morrison envisioned as condemning the Vietnam War. It was done in the style of Quang Duc, a Buddhist monk who had emulated himself in Saigon in protest against the government in Saigon. Morrison burning himself to death in front of the Pentagon was a way to denounce the war and the deaths it was causing. And in the hours following his death, his wife in his Quaker meeting released a statement saying uh, that essentially this is a witness against the war, talking about how he had really feared the conflict in Vietnam escalating and turning into a uh, nuclear conflict. And so he saw this sacrifice as necessary. Um, and this is uh, what you're seeing on the left here is a Vietnamese postage stamp that was actually created in, uh, in 1965 to honor Norman Morrison in North Vietnam, right? He became rather interestingly a hero of the North Viet Vietnamese for his opposition to the war. And so you see Morrison looking out at these anti-war protesters. Following him two days um, or seven days later was a member of the Catholic worker a guy named Roger Laporte, who went up to the steps of the UN, um, doused himself in kerosene and set himself on fire and killed himself there. Also seeing this as a witness against uh, the tragedy of war, uh, the threat of nuclear war. He's willing to die rather than uh, support war in any fashion. There's a third person who uh, also self-immolates in 1965. Um, this is a woman named Alice Hertz. She may have been a Unitarian. She at least attends Quaker meeting periodically. Um, she's a Holocaust survivor of Jewish descent. Uh, and she kills herself in D Detroit by uh, self-immolating. So there's these three self-immolations going on as part of this peace witness. And people are really divided on how to take this. Is this going too far with nonviolence? Could nonviolence include self-destruction as a necessary measure? Um, how far should you go with these convictions is something that people think about. It's worth noting that these movements spread internationally. This is the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament marching in 1961 with its chairman Bertrand Russell in the center, right? You'll notice here that they have a symbol. This is the nuclear disarmament symbol that's coming out of this movement for nuclear disarmament using nonviolent action. Um, and the nuclear disarmament symbol is actually the semaphore code for the letters N and D put together by the British artist Jared Holtham. And so you've probably seen this symbol everywhere. It becomes a ubiquitous symbol in American culture, sort of a testament to the, uh, the widespread nature of the peace movement and this particular sort of brand of the pacifist movement that you see people who don't even know the origin toting around this symbol from the British campaign for nuclear disarmament. I also want to note that some civil rights activists end up in maybe more surprising places. Uh, one Southern Christian leadership staff member, Chuck Fager, uh, in the early 1970s becomes involved with the anti-abortion movement uh, and starts teaching the anti-abortion movement direct action tactics. And so some of the things done by the anti-abortion movement by the late 70s, like getting arrested in front of clinics, uh, staging die-ins in front of abortion clinics uh, and other forms of protest that violate law are actually directly taken from the civil rights movement. And Fager himself ultimately abandons the anti-abortion movement by the late 1970s. Uh, he views it as anti-feminist by that point, but the tactics stick around. And I think that this is one avenue in which people doing research on nonviolence need to spend a lot more attention because we don't really have a good book on the use of nonviolent direct action by the anti-abortion movement, even though it seems to have been a thing that was actually quite common and is still in use by people in the anti-abortion movement as what they see as a parallel to civil rights. There's a really good book that I read last year um, by a historian on the, the, the kind of radical roots of um, the anti-abortion movement um, and the way in which you know it animated 
um, the nonviolent ideals of, of uh, numerous participants in the civil rights movement, and then the kind of changing discourses around um, abortion after after 1969, um, called Defend it's a really terrific book called Defenders of the Unborn. Um, it's an Oxford University Press book, um, but it's the closest thing I know to what you're looking for. Yeah, I, it's a hell I, of I know the book. I don't recall it having that much on nonviolent direct action. I really it's, want it's someone to write the history book. of yeah. Yeah, 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 violence yeah. in particular. But yeah, it is a good book. Um, yeah, so abortion is maybe one place where we don't expect this. Maybe a, a place where it seems more likely is the environmental movement heavily adopts direct action tactics. So Greenpeace makes use of nonviolent direct action. Uh, and this proves more hazardous than you might think. So uh, Greenpeace actually has their ship, the Rainbow Warrior, destroyed by the French government when it's observing a nuclear test. Greenpeace, this environmental organization, argues that the nuclear test will harm the environment. The French government, um, rather than arresting everybody, plants a bomb on Greenpeace's ship and they actually kill one of the Greenpeace activists uh, in the course of blowing up this ship. French special forces uh, later on are widely known to have done this. Nonviolence spreads into some other surprising contexts. So the Velvet Revolution in Hungary seems to have had a component of nonviolent direct action. I don't know as much about this as I'd like, um, but there seem to be people who actually do look to the U.S. civil rights movement in particular as something informing how to conduct actions against the, uh, the government in Hungary during the fall of communism in the Eastern Bloc. Thinking about this as a tactic that can bring about change nonviolently as the Eastern Bloc collapses. Uh, and I do think that like what we know, particularly of countries like Poland, it is worth pointing out that nonviolent tactics are like pretty effective at uh, eventually ending the USSR, and they do play a, a larger role than you may think. It's not just an economic collapse. There's also widespread civil disobedience. And probably the most famous image is, of course, when people gather together in mass and begin to just tear down the Berlin Wall. Or a pretty effective nonviolent direct action thing. They're not fighting anybody. They're just destroying this property in the middle of Berlin. One of the more recent examples is during the Arab Spring uh, and the uprising against uh, Hussein Mubarak in Egypt um, in Sharir Square. There was a lot of uh, sort of training happening in direct action. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is the comic you all read for today, that comic published by the Fellowship of Reconciliation about Martin Luther King, which was distributed in the American South um, and really made King far more widely known was translated into Arabic, and people actually found copies of this circulating in Tahrir Square, training people in this sort of nonviolent approach uh, as people were gathering together to try and get rid of the Mubarak regime. But this also might be an example in which, you know, the Arab Spring didn't end up bringing about a, a democratic transition. And so perhaps an example uh, to think about in which nonviolence can achieve a Proximate end, it overthrew the Mubarak government, but it didn't ultimately completely change Egyptian government. Nonviolent methods also showing up in Standing Rock, part of protests there against uh, building oil pipelines on native land. Uh, there have been lots of nonviolent direct action trainings connected with Standing Rock. Worth thinking about this as like another space in which nonviolent direct action moves to that's not directly connected with civil rights, at least as we think of it in the South in the 1950s and 60s, concerned primarily with African Americans. And lastly, if we're thinking about civil rights in new places, uh, or rather we're thinking about nonviolence and direct action going into new places, one place that's worth highlighting now is uh, the sanctuary movement. So the new sanctuary movement is uh, opposed to deportation. Many churches connected with um, various mainline Protestant denominations, people on the religious left, uh, Quaker meetings, um, a few uh, synagogues have taken in uh, people who are undocumented immigrants because uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement ICE doesn't do raids on uh, churches. And so one of the stances that people, um, people have is if people receive a final deportation order, if they're going to be deported from the US, this can be a way that they can 
not be immediately deported. So in Charlottesville, for instance, uh, Wesley United Methodist Church had uh, or still has a woman in sanctuary uh, as part of the new sanctuary movement. And it's worth observing that this is a kind of nonviolent direct action using a building, right, directly being opposed to law that requires a public presence. You need to publicly announce you're doing this in order to make it basically impossible with ICE's current uh, administrative rules to raid the, the building and to actually take that person and deport them. So pretty interesting current example of using nonviolent direct action. There's a whole bunch of strategy about nonviolent direct action. So if you're interested, one person you might want to check out is Gene Sharp. Gene Sharp recently died. He was head of what's called the Albert Einstein Institute. And most of his career was dedicated to thinking about this as a method, a thing that could be used in selective circumstances. And Sharp was pretty controversial because he accepted a lot of money from the US Department of Defense. And one of his uh, goals was to get people in military planning to take seriously nonviolence as a tactic, that it could be a thing that could achieve clear ends without the need to expend supplies or lead to death that would achieve uh, ends that otherwise you'd have to resort to military force for. Um, and so if you're interested in this stuff, uh, these books are pretty dry, but have a lot of examples of the ways in which people in the past have used nonviolent methods. So if there's big takeaway here, uh, I'll leave you with a uh, peaceable kingdom and two olives, uh, one of my favorite sort of comedic paintings of the past few years. Uh, I think the takeaways would be that nonviolence has declined since the civil rights era. Uh, Taylor Branch is right that it doesn't have the cache it once did, but it's still really important. It's still something that uh, does matter internationally and does topple governments still, right? If we're looking at nonviolent direct action, it's been a key component in various campaigns that have overthrown regimes, right? This is not a minor thing. Um, two, it's not just a United States phenomenon. Uh, nor is it just connected to Martin Luther King, right? This is a heritage that goes into India, it goes into Russia. Um, it's been adopted by large numbers of people, nor is it anchored only to Christianity. Many of the people using nonviolent methods aren't Christian. They're connecting it to other kinds of religious moorings. They're connecting it with other religious traditions. Um, so it's not sort of an exclusive method being used only by people professing Christianity. And the last take home I hope you emerge with is this is a philosophy. It's a way of life for some people. It's a sort of animating ideology, but it's also a method. It's a set of techniques that can achieve an end. It's something that can be learned, that people train in. Um, and it can be used as a method even by people who don't necessarily believe in the philosophy. Um, or it can be held as a philosophy by people who aren't using that method to engage in social change. Uh, but it's important to note that it's both. It's like there's a school of thought with this, but there are also a set of things that concretely can be done. Uh, I think it's really fascinating. I'd be glad to point you to more sources if you had any interest. That's what I got for you today. As soon as I can find my cursor to end the screen share. Here we go. Yeah, but I'd be glad to talk more or answer any questions you've got. Hey, how do I clap? It's uh, under reactions. Is there a standing O? <laughs> yeah, so this was such a, a great gift um, to us, Isaac. Um, and what a tour de force, the, the history of violence in you know, an hour and change. We have some time. I'd love to hear what your questions are and um, disagreements. Um, comments. I will point out this is a rosier picture of nonviolence than some people would give you. You could also go like, and here are the various ways that nonviolence has failed. Does fail, fair percentage of the time. And people also abandon it. Bayard Rustin, uh, you know, he ends up becoming uh, one of the architects of neoconservatism in the United States long after he's working with Martin Luther King. So an interesting trajectory. I can call on people who's, who look like they're just on the verge of a question. As, yeah.
Julia? Um, yeah, how do you think that nonviolence like could be like feasibly used today to make change in social justice movements? Uh, it really depends on the specific circumstance and what you're trying to achieve. Um, so uh, one, I think, really productive uh, place that people have done nonviolent activism in the recent past is um, people have begun to think about using nonviolence as corporate, um, basically corporate stockholders. So if you have enough corporate stock, you can sit in corporate board meetings and make various kinds of actions in corporate board meetings. Um, and so people involved in climate change have used corporate board seats in corporate board meetings to like keep introducing resolutions to divest from fossil fuels from various companies um, in a bunch of different ways. So that's like, it's technically legal to do. You're like allowed to be in the board meeting and it annoys everyone else in the room. And sometimes if it works enough, it actually does cause people to constantly be aware of the issue and maybe reconsider it. Um, there was a um, uh, guy who I actually went to div school with who um, disrupted an auction for oil lands by bidding on it when he had no ability to pay. Um, and so he's basically derailed the entire uh, ability of this auction to continue to exist by bidding, uh, I think he bid $100 billion on the oil lands. Uh, and so they had to end the auction and reschedule it in part because this guy bid on it. He served prison time for bidding at this auction without intent to pay, which I guess is technically a federal crime when it comes to oil lands. I got a substantial amount of publicity about this directed towards the ways the federal government uh, doesn't regulate oil lands, the ways in which there need to be tighter restrictions on who can purchase them and the ways in which they're going to use them. Um, so it's like doesn't instantly change things, but you know, for one guy willing to serve, uh, I think he served something like uh, served under a year. It's like he did generate a ton of publicity for a small action uh, without needing to do anything like that externally dramatic. Um, you know, and certainly it's uh, been useful in the UK and extent has regularly done things like die-ins that have gotten large amounts of attention. But it depends on what you're doing, right? You want to make sure your tactics fit what you're actually trying to achieve. Thank you. I would say if you're looking for the most effective nonviolent thing, uh, it strikes. So if you can create a wide scale labor disruption, uh, you will achieve some kind of political end like pretty rapidly. Um, and so like in the, in the Gene Sharp books on nonviolent direct action, uh, do I have these? Yeah, uh, basically like almost all of the widespread general labor strikes he chronicles in which like people stop driving like taxi cabs or stop operating trolleys. And there are a widespread amount of people across several professions who join in an organized labor strike achieve some kind of political end like pretty fast. If you can shut down a city, like people will acquiesce to your demands really rapidly. Has to be more than one profession though for that to work. Karen, yeah? Yeah. Um, I recently had a conversation with one of my friends um, and she was talking about the relationship between nonviolent movements and uh, like more radical, more militant movements. Um, and she was talking about how arguably Martin Luther King Jr. and his non nonviolent demonstrations would not have seen the success if it weren't for more militant groups um, led by people like Malcolm X. So do you see there that in occasions there's almost um, a relate like a dependent relationship between the two types of movements. Yeah, I mean, it's like certainly King uh, understands that the threat of violence is omnipresent while he's engaged in nonviolence, right? That he represents one option between a host of options in which the threat of violence exists as a thing that people are concerned about. And this is also true with Gandhi, right? There are more militant people than Gandhi who exist out there who are advocating a far more uh, violent like attack on the British Empire that the British em Empire is aware of while dealing with Gandhi's movement. Um, so yeah, I mean, nonviolence does exist symbiotically maybe with more violent approaches. Um, although it is also worth pointing out that certain kinds of violence like do undermine uh, nonviolent approaches. So if you have a demonstration in which some of the people are dedicated to nonviolent tactics, 
and some of the people are using violent tactics, um, it basically is impossible to create any kind of publicity that clearly distinguishes between the violent people and the nonviolent folks. And you lose the ability of the demonstration to be very coherent. And so, like, I mean, one of the things King does strategically is if he thinks demonstrations are going to go in violent directions, he tends to call them off just because you need people to maintain a uniform level of discipline in any given action um, so that you're not ending up with people doing completely contradictory things. And it's also worth pointing out that this example also exists with the, uh, the abolitionist movement, right? Garrison exists. There are, uh, he's advocating like non-engagement with politics. There are people who want to engage with politics. And then like you've got on the far extreme, like John Brown is like, I'm going to start a slave revolt like right now, goes off to Harper's Ferry and like tries to basically like distribute a bunch of pikes to people to start a slave revolt in like 1859, um, which is, does not match Garrison's model at all. And it's like, it's a combination of pressures in which people are end up crediting both Garrison and Brown for bringing about the Civil War, um, which, you know, the combination of the two uh, do exert enough pressure that like eventually there is a change, although it ends up being a, a far more violent change than Garrison intended. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting, um... Those of you who take my course, Kingdom of God in America, in the spring, will encounter this community called Quantania Farm. And one of, um, one of Clarence Jordan's and this group of um, kind of radical pacifist Christians, critique of King is um, similar. It, 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 it reminds me of, of the point your friend made, Karen, um, this phrase, the man of nonviolence, King, who remind, who relied on the men of great violence um, for um, the social movement. And um, I, if, I don't, if, if I may just point our attention to, you know, Niebuhr's critique, you, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr was one of the great theologians, important theologians of the 20th century, but we also look again at him in his work next week. And you mentioned um, his his journey uh, um, from uh, nonviolence to um, you know a kind of defense of um, of, of coercion in um, social struggle and you know po uh, foreign uh, political life. Um, and if you look at that second, if you look at that second quote I sent, uh, did it come through? Did, did, did those did those passages come through? Um, no, you didn't. Huh? Check now. Okay. No? Wonder why. No, did not come through, eh? Hmm. Um, all right. Somebody else ask a question. I'll find a passage and come back to it in a minute. Because I do want to ask you to sort of um, to respond to that. Oh, yeah, it went through. It just went through. Oh, yeah. Oh, it did? All right. So it's the second one. Um, will you just open it up uh, here? It's not opening, of course. Um, well, I can find the passage in the book. Do you see the... Um... Oh, I can paste it into the chat for you. Mm -hmm. Do you see the um, 331? Uh, do you see a passage that reads uh, uh, something like um, the, the, the differences between violent and nonviolent methods of coercion and resistance are not so absolute? Do you see that text? Yes. Oh, you do? Oh, OK, good. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, the differences between, um, this is from moral, uh, moral Man and Immoral Society. The differences between, in, right, Reinhold Niebuhr, between violent and nonviolent methods of coercion and resistance are not so absolute that it would be possible to regard violence 
as a morally impossible instrument of social change. And you know, the way he gets at that is um, by um, um, arguing that nonviolent uh, direct action is um, parasitic on, on violent, um, on, on parasitic on the state, on state violence, on, on police force. Um, but um, as a you know as a technique, it um, it, um, it it re requires it, it depends uh, uh, its it, its success depends on um, uh, the same um, the same kind of, uh, of of coercion and humiliation um, certainly different in degree uh, but but not in you know, principle from the use of violence. And so, you know, he would argue for a, you know, a pragmatic consideration of the circumstance. Um, and, um, you know, in his dismissal of, uh, of any meaningful philosophical difference between nonviolent direct action and violence. I, I you know, you, so how, how do you respond to that, that, you know, I think um, the, the note I wrote here is that pacifism assumes, this is from Niebuhr, it's not, it's not me, uh, pacifism assumes that the kingdom of God, um, you know, is this kind of possible impossibility, it's this transcendent ideal, it's almost like um, an eschatological um, idea that, um, that, you know, regulates behavior in certain ways and, and the, uh, um, kind of shapes the moral imagination, but um, cannot and, dare, and ought not, along with the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus's teachings on peace, um, be applied literally to the social conflict as a, uni as a universal principle. Um, and that doing so is, um, is a delusive, a delusional simplification of a vast complexity. Can I offer way too many Niebuhr thoughts? I know you love Reinhold Niebuhr. Yeah, I, for those for those who don't know, I've spent like at least half a decade arguing against Reinhold Niebuhr in various ways. Um, well, I, yeah. I I mean, we all do. We have to. He is a, a giant who towers very high. It is worth pointing out when, like, when this is written, Gandhi had not, in fact, managed to achieve, like, Indian independence was, like, not a thing. And Reinhold Niebuhr wrote this in part to justify a socialist revolution through violence, which, one, never came, and right. two, by, like, the 1950s, he ends up arguing something totally else with the use of force, in which then, then you use force by the 50s to enforce American power, because American power is, like, the logical end of essentially religion by the 50s for Niebuhr. Um, and not to be forgotten is that um, in the early months um, of the Montgomery bus boycott, when Martin Luther King is, um, and the church people of Montgomery are launching what proves to be, you know, an, an extraordinary exemplification of the power of nonviolent direct action to um, enact social change, Reinhold Niebuhr refuses to write a letter of support, you know, um, to Eisenhower. And he, um, he, 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 he argues in Christianity in Crisis, Christian Century Nation, for a position of gradualism that is really no different than that of, you know, William Faulkner and his ilk. also always wonder about this argument that certain biblical principles are impossible to live up to, where I'm never sure how Niebuhr distinguishes that principles. Cause like, he doesn't think that about like adultery, like adultery is presumably something that like might be like, you know, he goes like, oh, like that's clearly like meant to be there. You live up to that principle, but somehow like not killing people is the principle that's like impossible to attain in average life. I don't know about you all. I've like never killed anybody. Um, so like it can't be impossible to do like if you've managed to go a good number of years without doing it. But for Jesus, the 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 whole the whole thing with the Sermon on the Mount 
how I understood it is like, it's also anger and then adultery, it's also lust. So it's not, and sorry, I, I, I was just kind of thinking about other things there, but. Um, Valid, but Niebuhr takes the lust part very seriously, right? I mean, if you were engaged in some kind of action that he saw as lustful, he'd be very like, he doesn't argue that that's suspended as an impractical rule. Unless you're his, his colleague, Paul Tillich, and then you let it fall. Yeah, well, to be fair, Tillich is a little uh, little sounder on the pacifism and less sound on the, uh, the, the lust bit, perhaps. Yeah, well, yeah, that's an understatement, but yeah. Um, other questions? I think kind of going along with that, kind of in this similar conversation, what, if any, is the discussion of the violence um, against self if you do or do not engage in nonviolence? Um, kind of specifically with Niebuhr here, like, yes, with violence, there's, uh, like, it might it might work better in, in some areas than nonviolence, but not only is, is violence incurring um, literal violence, literal hurt against others. Like, what does that do to the self, to the soul? Um, kind of specifically in this religious bent, um, with both an eschatological view of like in the future, if I've killed somebody or if I've been violent, what does that mean for me later um, during a judgment or during a, a next life? But is there a similar idea in nonviolence? Like, am I taking, like, is there an atoning kind of aspect of nonviolence? Like, I, I, the violence that I am taking upon myself, yet not enacting, is an atoning sacrifice kind of. I'm not sure if all of those work together well, but I'm just kind of very interested in the notion of violence against the self, whether intended or not so much. So, yeah. Certainly there are parts of the sort of non-resistant folks in the 19th century that argue violence inflicted upon you counts as causing violence. So like one of the rationales behind the non, the, the total non-resistant position is that if you're causing others to like beat you, that that counts as violence and like you should be trying to minimize that as much as possible. Um, generally in this sort of like uh, the main line of people attached to like fellowship of reconciliation, they don't really view other people inflicting violence upon them as like a moral stain on themselves. But most of the people attached to a fellowship who uh, reconciliation, most of the folks in the sort of Quaker pacifist circles um, do think that self-destruction is a step too far. So like Norman Morrison, who's burning himself to death um, or uh, Robert Laporte, people sort of like try to walk a line between going like their sacrifice is very nice and like we appreciate what they did for us like don't do that that's like not a thing you want to encourage people to do um just because like that's still killing Appreciate any evening in which I get to wrestle with Ron Holmeber. May I ask a, a, a question um, quickly on um, how um, Quaker, um, the Quaker tradition has, um, has, has, has embraced non, has, has, um, has, um, I'm so tired. Are we all exhausted? I'm just so tired, I can't see straight. I'm both inspired and energized and like, you know, we've been on Zoom all week, um, um, all semester. Oh, okay, but it's a, it's a really good question. It's not, it's just, a, it's a very modest question. And how it is that the Quaker tradition, you know, differentiates itself and uh, from the Anabaptist tradition and the, you know, the kind of 
uh, spirituality of, of nonviolent non-resistance, um, you know, which is based on a, you know a kind of um, you know a, a rigid um, and, um, and and literal and um, uh, non-negotiable you know uh, interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, is it is it that Quakerism has um, been able to incorporate a, a, a you know a pragmatic um, principle, um, you know, in, in in its understanding of nonviolence. So nonviolence is this, um, you know, it's not a, a universal um, rule that's you know has to be applied uh, in every situation. So any even those encounters that you know, remain nonviolent, but that trade on the humiliation or, or the shaming of the other are, are, are rendered, you know, you know um, sinful even. So, you know, uh, Quakerism would imagine uh, nonviolence to have this elasticity um, as a power, a, a malleability, um, an adaptability. Um, that's a lot different than, you know, the kind of doctrinaire, um, principle of nonviolent, non-resistant. So you know, just help me think through how Quakerism has, um, has, has both, you know, theologically and kind of strategically um, um, landed in this space. So if you're talking the 1650s, this is based on biblical proof texting that looks fairly similar to Anabaptists. The yeah. difference being that Quakers don't end up embracing the two kingdoms sort of uh, reformation theology of it's okay for the magistrate to weld the sword. So Anabaptists go, the state can engage in violence just like we can't as Christians, but the state isn't Christian. We just like live in it. We don't engage in it. Yeah. We, do, we don't vote, therefore it's like not on us. Um, but Quakers just took the same biblical proof text and never developed that sense. By the 19th century, the basis I think has really changed and it becomes in liberal Quaker circles about the value of human life. They use the Gospel of John to talk about, like, you know, the spirit is in man. This becomes by the 19th century uh, a discussion about the inner light in each person, about the divine worth of human beings. Um, this gets applied in abolition as, like, thereby slaves would have an ultimate divine worth. And then it becomes any action that causes the death of a human being or like the degradation of a human being violates this very lofty conception of um, human agency, human self, human worth. Um, and it also would have, comes with the implication that the conscience is sort of the supreme guide and in some sense divine. Uh, and so there are various people that talk about the inner light speaking to you, God speaking to you does not speak through a book but rather speaks through the agency of conscience, which tells you some basic things like don't kill, don't cause harm, like love your fellow. And this actually begins to replace conventional theology by the late 19th century, which is what my dissertation is on. And like one of the reasons I find this also interesting is like, how do you move from going like we're doing biblical proof texting to actually we think human beings are like the ultimate in that like value. And we think preserving human life is really important. So by like 1955, you get Bayard Rustin and a handful of other folks write Speak Truth to Power. And Speak Truth to Power actually argues we shouldn't even use a religious framework at all not to do nonviolence. We should just feel that like harming others is like an ultimate evil. And therefore, we're going to eliminate war and not have a nuclear war with the Soviets. And they give you a pretty concrete plan not to do that. Um, yeah, and they're quite proud of their plan. Mm -hmm. Wow, this was just um, this was just uh, you know mind blowing two and a half hours, and um, you've given us, um, as I said earlier, a great gift. Um, for those of you who want to work on themes um, uh, that connect um, Isaac's presentation and the civil rights movement, or, or, or specifically. Um, Questions about um, nonviolence as, as a strategy and as a, as a, as a theological principle. 
um, are as a um, as a kind of universal kind of anthropological um, uh, affirmation. Um, there is a, a lot of good um, literature. Um, well, not a lot. There is a solid canon of uh, literature on nonviolence specifically. I like John Moses's book. I don't know if you've seen that book on nonviolence in King, um, but we will be happy to, to um, guide you um, to any sources. Um, perhaps on this final day, uh, that is perhaps on our last day of, of class, some of you will have um, grappled further with the question that arises directly out of the movement that you know James Cone um, framed dramatically in his book Malcolm and Martin, which is not to say Malcolm versus Martin, but Malcolm and Martin uh, on on these you know two kinds of um, um, of of of, uh, of of organizing and. Uh, Philosophical um, trajectories uh, uh, in the nonviolent movement that I still that I think still are ever present in ongoing um, social uh, movements for racial justice. There, there, there are still there, there are still these these questions that are unresolved on on um, you know um, not only the most effective means but the, um, you know trading on uh, Haven's question strategies that um, that bring uh, dignity um, um, to human being and that are um, um, you know constitutive of self-respect and self-love and in, in addition to you know uh, um, care uh, for the other and for the social good so um, Isaac can we do another? Round of applause. Um, many, many thanks.